Thank you. Thank you, Hussein. Um, so I think, you know, it's become very usual that when we hear the word reprisal, usually the word Bahrain comes right afterwards. Uh, it's something that a lot of people now connect uh, to each other. You, ra you rarely hear people discussing the issue of reprisals without bah Bahrain coming up as an example of a country that practices reprisals against human rights defenders. Now, of course, the targeting of human rights defenders can come in many various forms and ways. Um, for example, we have the old ways, which have been ongoing for many, many years and even prior to 2011. It's not something that, of course, started with the movement of human rights and pro-democracy in Bahrain. But when we're talking about things like defamation campaigns, targeting, incitement to violence against individuals, and the list goes on, these are things that have been happening for a long time. Um, you know, whether we're talking about human rights defenders like Abdul Hadi Al-Khwaja and Nabil Rajab since 2001, uh, because of their coming to Geneva and speaking about issues if, uh, that are ongoing in Bahrain here, or otherwise. Um, we have seen some forms of new types of attacks. One of them happened to me personally. I attempted to travel back to Bahrain in August 2013. And for the first time that we know of, a Bahraini citizen was denied boarding on a flight to go back to their own country. And this has not happened before. We have not seen before someone who's a citizen of a country being denied boarding on a flight by order of the Bahraini government from going back to their own country. Um, and then we have, of course, the November attacks. In November 2013, the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, along with co-sponsors, launched a campaign called Wanted for Justice. This campaign was meant to highlight individuals implicated in very serious human rights violations. Things like torture, extrajudicial killings, and so on and so forth. And right after those uh, names were published by the BCHR, calling for an investigation, and of course then a fair trial, if evidence was found of the implication of these individuals in violations, there were several governmental, non-governmental organizations in Bahrain who then launched their own wanted, uh, wanted campaign in the local media in Bahrain, where they named and put pictures of uh, local human rights defenders as being wanted for inciting terrorism, for inciting violence, uh, for inciting hatred against expatriates or migrant workers, and the list goes on. Now, the people who were highlighted in, these, in this campaign Many of them were not actually involved in the Wanted for Justice campaign that was run by the BCHR. They're people who are human rights defenders, who are based in Bahrain, who usually, many of them actually work with the UN mechanisms. And their pictures and names were printed in the local media calling them uh, people who incite terrorism. Now one of them, uh, two of them actually, Mohammed al Masqati who's sitting here, and Hussein Jawad of the European Bahraini Organization for Human Rights, went to uh, file complaints against the uh, defamation campaign that happened. Hussein Jawad was arrested and put in prison after when he went to file that complaint. Moving a little bit more forward, we have just a few weeks ago a 20-minute video that was done that was released on YouTube called Letters from Bahrain, where three of, two of the people you can see up there, Abdul Hadi Al-Khwaja Nabir Rajab and Zainab Al-Khwaja and myself, were named, and our pictures were put in that video. And again, we were highlighted as people who tell children to use violence, tell them not to get an education, as people who are racist, as people who are holding the, the country uh, hostage, and the list goes on. 20 minutes, they can say a lot of things. Um, but the point of this video was first to create defamation, to target our credibility, but also to incite violence. Now, the people who speak in that video introduce themselves as anonymous because they're worried that we will target them if they say who they are. And so to present us as being violent and so on. Now, if you look at the footage that is used in that video, you will see that a lot of it comes from helicopters, from inside police vehicles, and so on and so forth. So very, very official footage that is being used in that video. So it doesn't look like just a simple citizen made it. To add to that, when we're looking at the situation in Bahrain of human rights defenders right now, you know, I always say, every single time I speak here in Geneva, I always say, if you want to know the human rights situation in any country, ask where their human rights defenders are. In Bahrain right now, we used to have the most prominent human rights defenders in prison. 
and then several on the ground who are being targeted and harassed. Sayyid Yusuf al muhafda who has been here several times, usually sitting right next to me speaking, is now, has now had to apply for political asylum in Germany because he was publicly threatened by a supporter of the government who used to work for the CID, for the Ministry of Interior, sorry, who told him publicly on Twitter, if I find you, I will make you look worse than minced meat. On Twitter, in his own name. And Hussein Jawad has had to go and apply for asylum in London. Mohammed al-Musqatli is just about the only known and prominent human rights defender that remains in Bahrain who is not in prison or in exile. So we're looking at the situation where we're basically running out of human rights defenders because of, there's so much control and so much targeting against human rights defenders that it's just no longer possible for people to operate within the country. I'll try to speed up here so that Hussein doesn't need to show me any more messages. Um, <clears throat> now we had here in the Human Rights Council a resolution passed on human rights defenders, which is a great step. And it's something that I'm sure all human rights defenders applaud and support. But that resolution is not going to mean much if it is not implemented. If con uh, member countries of the Human Rights Council, if those who have the ability and the capacity to implement it and hold states accountable, do not use that resolution to protect and support human rights defenders around the world, then that resolution will not have meant anything. And I think that would be my, res my recommendation, is we have the basis now, we have the resolution. It needs to be used to hold people accountable. When you have member states like Bahrain, who systematically target human rights defenders, I mean, two, people of, two of the people in that defamation video are in prison, have been for a while, and they're still seen as a threat by the government, that they would need to make a 20-minute defamation video about them while they're sitting in prison. And so when you have member states here in the Human Rights Council, those are member states that need to be held accountable. And the resolution, I think, is the best first step to do so. Thank you.